The weekly Industry Angel podcast hears from business leaders and entrepreneurs who share their stories and that all-important light bulb moment. This can inspire us all and maybe scratch that itch and kickstart that idea that keeps you awake at night. Welcome to episode 35 of the Industry Angel. It's the 1st of December, the day of opening up your advent calendar, and of course now the new tradition of placing those naughty elves in mischievous positions around the house. Well, my kids didn't like the prank this morning as those elves went and ate all the chocolates out of their advent calendars. I enjoyed it though, and that's the main thing. <laughs> thanks to thanks for your feedback on Scott, on Scott Gumbar last week, uh, episode 34. That was all about SEO. Quite a few have got in touch and said that you took some good takeaways from that and you're going to be implementing that into your strategy. So really pleased about that. Right, episode 35. There's a lot going on in here, so let's get on with it. Today we have certified business coach from over in Toronto. Welcome to Industry Angel, Nikki Morris. Hello, everyone. Hi, Nikki. Have you got your hat and scarf out yet? So yes, it is that time of year here in Toronto. And just since the weekend, actually, over the past few days, it has uh, the temperature has dropped and we have some snow. Well, you've got snow already. Uh, unfortunately, yes. A little bit earlier <laughs> than we would like. You know, in the UK, we always we always pray for snow and we bet whether it's going to be a white Christmas. But you guys just, you, like you say, you say unfortunately, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Everything kind of just slows down and you have to wear more outdoor clothing. And so it's a little more cumbersome. Well, we love that here. But you know, as it grinds us to a halt, like two or three centimetres of snow grinds the UK to a halt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're at about seven to eight. We'll start to, you know, slow things down. <laughs> So, Nikki, we're going to talk business strategy today. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Excellent, me too. But before we dive in, would you mind giving our audience a bit of an idea of your experience to date? Sure, would love to. Um, I spent about 18 years in the, the corporate sector, I, um, a variety of different roles, and actually in the, uh, the private health sector uh, in Canada. Um, my most recent corporate role, I was the vice president of a national health care and seniors care company where we had about uh, 5,000 employees within my portfolio and we, um, we serviced seniors across the country in uh, rehab and home care services. And in 2013, I had this desire to, um, to go back to my entrepreneurial roots. My mom had actually started a business in the early 1970s, and, and I worked with her. I had the great uh, privilege and honor of being able to work with my mom and in our family business. And we sold that business in 2004, and I'd had the opportunity through my mom to to learn about uh, being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, serving others, and all of the, the trials and tribulations that come with that. And after working with her, went back to the more traditional corporate sector, and then in 2013 decided I wanted to launch my own business. And I spent about 10 months preparing to do that. As people say, you know, walking away from your nine to five, I, I actually called it uh, firing myself. And I spent 10 months preparing to fire myself throughout 2013, uh, used a variety of strategies and very intentional plan on how to, to do that and start my own business consulting firm. So in early 2014, I launched my traditional business consulting firm. And by traditional, I mean, I work face to face with um, healthcare business owners and business leaders across Canada, uh, mainly in the areas of, of strategy, business development, operational improvement, and leadership development. And that business has done quite well, and I've been growing that. And more recently, I've started to transition into the online space, where I do online business coaching and business consulting with small and medium-sized business owners, but more on a global basis with the uh, English-speaking world, um, mainly throughout uh, North America and Europe where I work with clients to in sort of two different areas. One is those looking to leave their nine to five job and they want to start their own business, but they have no idea of how to run a business. So I work with them with what I call business base camp knowledge development and giving them and helping them with the fundamentals of developing their business and understanding how to own, manage and lead a business. And I also work with people are having around confidence. 
Because a lot of people who do start their own business, and even if they know what to do, they actually know the mechanics, they know they need to register a business, they have to pay taxes and, and all of those things, a lot of times they're limited and in, in face blocks and barriers due to confidence and lack of confidence related to business ownership. Uh, so I work with people in two areas, one the, the business side and on the other side around their success mindset and being able to combine the strategy of their business with their confidence to then launch and grow a successful, profitable business that is the um, often the dream and passion of many people. Well, th well thanks for that. And now I'm gonna take you back, I'm gonna take you back to 2013 because you skirted over something here which I guess you help your clients with, and that's launching a business, you know, going from, as you said, you fired yourself, so going from a full-time job to then going into your own business. Yes. You mentioned ten. You mentioned 10 months, Nikki, so what did that 10 months look like? Were you, were you still working whilst you planned your business, or did you go all out and, and quit? Yeah, no, that 10 months I was working full-time um, because I needed to do two things. One, I had to figure out what I was going to do and how I was going to do it, and I needed to prepare my my personal life financially to be able to um, to walk away from a, and I must say a very lucrative career, um, in a company that I loved with amazing people. So I wasn't in a position of, you know, I'm, I'm hating my job, I'm tired of it. Uh, it was a great opportunity. I'd been promoted two years before into this role. I, it had many, many doors opening for me there, uh, but it was not fulfilling the, the entrepreneurial passion that I had. So in the 10 months prior, and it was a little bit longer than that, we'll say about 15 months from when I made the decision to do it, but then 10 months of actual structured planning. And that involved a few different things. One, I, I set goals of that I needed at least a six months to a year of, of financial savings that when I launched my business and went from having a bi-weekly paycheck to having no income, that I would be able to survive. I had also made a decision that I was going to start a very um, low overhead and low cost startup business. So other than having a website, uh, I was not going to be investing a ton of my own money into, into my business. Um, so really my initial purchases were getting a website developed uh, getting, and getting business cards, essentially. And because it was a traditional business and I was going to be working in the same area as my current network, I then created a business development plan, which in, was... Um, which I called sort of this almost clandestine um, networking. So I was meeting with my business network and what I was doing is I was asking them, uh, and they didn't realize the intent of why I was doing this, um, you know, what, what challenges are you facing in your business? And some of these were my business competitors at the time and people I'd known for, for 10, 15 years that we would just go out for coffee or lunch and, you know, through the course of the conversation, I'd say, you know, what, what kind of challenges are you guys facing in your business? And people were happy to, to share that, you know, and say, oh, we're having a hard time. You know, our, our managers aren't the leaders we need them to be. Um, we're investing a ton of into marketing, but our revenue's not growing our, or our revenue's growing, but our profit's not. And so I would making these mental notes of these challenges and when, then I would go away and I would start to develop solutions for those challenges, but I wouldn't take those solutions back to them because this is how I was going to approach my business development once I launched my business. But I need to, needed to understand the problems that my prospective customers and clients were having in their business. I was meeting with a lot of individual, um, I do a lot of work with healthcare professionals and healthcare practitioners who want to start their own business. And I met with them and, you know, kind of, well, why haven't you left? Like you, you want to start your business and, or you have started it, but it's not doing as well. What problems are you facing? What, what are the barriers? What are the issues? So again, did a lot of like problem discovery and used all of that, started to make my notes as to potential solutions I could offer continued to save my money and plan out my business. And then it was, it was actually um, three years ago this week that I fired myself. And Excellent. I had done my coaching certification throughout those 10 months. And on the final weekend of the coaching program, uh, when the certification was going to be complete, we each had to make a commitment of what we were going to do with our coaching certification. And my commitment to the group that was that tomorrow being the Monday, I was going to go in and fire myself. 
And I did that. I couldn't believe I'd said it out loud. Uh, and that's an important part, I'm sure, as you know, is when you're making a commitment, um, the more people you tell and the more you say it out loud, the more real it becomes. And I did that, went into my boss, and I, of course, was nervous and afraid as to what the response might be. And I said that I was, you know, resigning and I gave lengthy notice. I gave about six weeks notice and um, she was actually very happy for me, which was, uh, which was a nice Excellent. relief. Yes. She actually said she was a bit envious. Um, <laughs> and so we had a good, you know, discussion related to that. And I then, of course, the, the news went out within the, the sector and within my network and within the business world that I was starting my own business. And at that point, I could now go out to the people I'd been meeting with over the past 10 months and start to say, you know, you said you had these issues with your business. You know, I have some potential solutions I'd like to talk to you about. So the day I left my business, which was, uh, or my job, which was J January 6, 2014, I actually had three clients. You know, a lot of us um, who've, who've done this, I think the starting is the hardest part. Yes. But it was, it was really interesting that you said there that you, you said you had a quite a lucrative job. And I, and I think, again, many people you speak to, it's not always about the money, is it? You know, it's about more about the happiness and maybe having that itch to scratch, we always say. Yes. Just to, to start this. So... I guess you must have had a supportive family around you to do this. Uh, yeah, I had very good social support. My my family thought I was a little bit crazy, like are you, and, <laughs> and more in the sense they were they're you know, concerned for my well being, right? Yeah. Um, now my mom, being an entrepreneur, she kind of got the, you know, the rationale as to why I'd want to do that. Uh, but the other piece that I put in sense of my own safety net was I was going to give myself two years to make my business work. And by that work meaning and be successful, meaning not just from a financial perspective, but from a lifestyle perspective, because, you know, as we know, we can be making a lot of money, but not be very happy Too and, right. um, and not have the, you know, the freedom and lifestyle that we, we desire. And I, I set that two year time frame. It would be different for different people. And I'm sure for your listeners, it would be different. Um, but I knew I could keep my network strong and my industry knowledge strong for the two years. That if I needed to go back and get a traditional job, that I would still have the contacts in the sector to be able to do that. So knowing that that two year window was now open and I was sort of on the, the track, kind of the two year marathon to get there, I set very particular goals knowing that, you know, if I achieve these, then you know, this is going to be my, my career for, for the rest of my life. And if I didn't achieve that, that was okay because I gave it a try. It didn't work out and my network's still good and I'm going to go back to a regular job. So there's going to be listeners here who, who are in this boat, okay, Nikki? So, you know, looking to, to think about this start now, the key things you said there, you, you had a plan, you had mm -hmm. some goals, you had a time scale and you had some finance behind you as well. You'd saved, you gave yourself a runway to be able to pay yourself. Yes. Over this, you know, this next year or two. Yes. And I had the strong social support. Sure. That is the so, other piece that's, that's very important um, yeah. that people have. So it's a, it's a plan and support. Um, and then, you know, passion and perseverance and a lot of those other things. Of course. But of course, and, and you've got a value proposition. You've, you've got a product or service yes. to take the market, which you've done a little bit of homework there on the side. You know, you've been, you've been in employment, but you've made sure that you've understood there's a need for what you're going to put to market. Yes. In terms of other business owners who start this, is that a mistake that you see then when people start businesses that haven't done this groundwork, this homework? Yes. You know what? And I don't know if it's actually a mistake, but I do see people with great passion and drive and desire to do what they love, but there needs to be a market for it. And otherwise it's just a hobby, right? If, if people aren't going to pay you, for what yeah. you are selling, whether that's a product or a service, then, and that's okay, but that, that's a hobby. That's not, that's not a career or a business. And I think a lot of people chase their passion or want to change their hobby into something income generating, but they haven't tested the market. And the key to any successful business is solving a problem for your prospective customer, right? If someone, if you're going to sell t-shirts, you know, the problem is people want a t-shirt that says whatever are made of the material or quality or whatever it is. There has to be a gap in that person's life that your product or service is going to fulfill. 
And you have to test your market. You have to understand your competition. Many people say to me, um, well, the competition is just, is just noise. I don't have the, the time or the money or the resources to, to learn about my competition. And, and I say that's just an excuse because you can find out about your competition by making a phone call. That's free. By going to their website, that's free. If it's a, you know, a physical location, you can stand outside their door and see the people and the type of people coming in and out. You can go in and buy their products. You can go and return a product and see what type of customer service they offer. So you don't have to invest in, in mystery shops and in all of these very expensive reports and documents that, that companies charge for. You can, yeah. you can do it yourself. Um, and we, don't, we tend to make things more challenging and complicated than we need to. But I would really say doing the groundwork related to knowing what you're offering, your value proposition, which is your features, functions, and benefits of what you're going to offer, that people are prepared to pay for that and that you're targeting the right market is the key once you have your passion. Yeah. I just mentioned a few techniques there and what I tend to use when I do when I do a similar scenario to yourself is I use the business model canvas and the value proposition canvas. What sort of techniques do you do with, with your clients to, to help go through these um well, I, I guess those things have just gone down there, you know, time scale, goals, financial, look yep. at the value proposition. What do you use for those? Yeah, we, I, we create a plan um, which starts off with assessing the business, the viability of their business concept. And, and every business can, is viable. You just have to find the right market and the right people. And so we, we do an assessment of the viability and we also do an assessment of, you know, is this going to be a, a full-time thing for them, a side hustle, a part-time? Uh, what is it going to be? Is it, are they doing it just because they're a mom and they want to stay home with the kids? And we talk a lot about their why. What's their why? What's their driving force? Because being a business owner is hard and starting a business is even harder. And so when the going gets tough, you have to always know where your, your why is, what's your motivation and your inspiration. So a lot of it starts with mindset and viability. We then go into value proposition and what's gonna be offered, um, market analysis, competitor analysis, and then look to what your product or service is going to be, where, where are you going to place that product, is it going to be sold online? Are you going to have a, a store? What's the placement of it? We then talk about the promotion of the product. How are you going to market your product? How are you going to get leads to your services? Are you going to offer discounts? Are you going to build a Facebook group? How are you going to promote? So there was the product, the placement, the promotion, and the fourth is being pricing strategy. And so once you've tested your concept, you know there's a market, you develop your value proposition, we then move into those sort of four Ps, which are sort of traditional MBA type types of things. Um, and then from there, we talk about selling, um, applications around productivity. Are you going to need staff? How are you going to scale the business? Um, are you gonna have a payroll? We also do a lot around business structure, the legal structures. Are you going to be a sole proprietor? Uh, a partnership, a, a LLC, a corporation. Um, and obviously there's pros and cons to those things. And I ensure that my clients have the professional advisory network because I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I am not an accountant, and I do not advise on those, um, those types of matters, but I ensure that they have their legal team, their financial advisory team surrounding them to advise on those things, to ensure that they have the, um, the financial aspects, their insurance in place, um, to manage their the liability and their risk. If I can just take you back to the, to the pricing element, yes. you know, um, quite often I see clients, they have a race to the bottom. They think they're USP. They have to be the cheapest. Yes. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, it is a, um, a challenge. You do not have to be the cheapest. There are plenty examples in the marketplace. I often use with people, especially when they're starting out um, and they price themselves low because they, they want to get a first few clients. Uh, but human nature, and we see this in the auto industry, is people are prepared to pay more for a Mercedes-Benz or a BMW 
than a Honda or a Toyota. And despite those two items or those two brands offering essentially the same thing, a vehicle that's a mode of transportation to go from point A to point B. People are prepared to pay more and they believe they are getting more from the more expensive car. They are getting more from the gourmet restaurant versus the fast food restaurant, which charges less. At the end of the day, you, it's, it's food. One might have more nutritional value. There's a different value proposition being offered. And this is why nailing your value proposition is very important to how it relates to your pricing strategy. And so, sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. I was just going to jump in there. I know we spoke about imposter syndrome as well. And, and I think yeah. this is something that um, I think we've probably all felt, you know, um, I guess standing up in meetings and speaking sometimes your mind can play tricks on you yeah. and you look at other people and you kind of self-doubt yourself. Is this something that you coach with, with, within your um, scope of work? Yes, it's probably the most common area related to mindset um, that I work with people on, especially uh, not when people are starting out because the imposter syndrome is a little bit real there. Like I've never really run a business yet. So it's more once they're in a year or so, they're not making the money or the profit or getting the number of new customers in that they want. And when you start to look at it and their business model is good, often it's imposter syndrome where they have do not feel that they are worthy of charging a particular price because they will have a variety of excuses or reasons um, for that. And it really is that they feel like, like a fraud, like, like who I might be an excellent ex, but who am I to be charging, you know, $150, $300 an hour? I really don't know what I'm doing. And there's a fear of people finding them out. And it's an unfounded fear, but it is extremely common. And when I work with people, we don't, I don't work with them to, to overcome it because I, I'm not a psychologist and a lot of the imposter syndrome, things related to self, self-worth and value are, yeah. are rooted in other parts of psychology. And I, and I don't go down that way because it will take us down another path that's not particularly helpful for business development, but rather take the imposter syndrome, acknowledge it, realize that when we're pricing our services, we're pricing too low because of imposter syndrome, and then work with that to say, Our pricing strategy is not going to be inhibited or limited by my imposter syndrome. I know I'm, I'm valued. I have, you know, a hundred testimonials or positive reviews from my customers. I have the education. I have the competencies and competencies is a word I use a lot with people, which is the knowledge, skills, and judgment. So we validate that you have the knowledge, skills, and judgment to do what you do. And therefore the imposter syndrome is little bit unfounded and it just sort of sits there in our head, but we're not going to let it impact that we're actually worth X amount and our product is actually worth a top dollar because we know people are prepared to pay that. And I have imposter syndrome and people think I'm, I'm crazy. I have, (laughs) I worked 18 years in a sector. I've developed businesses. I've managed businesses over $200 million. I have four university degrees. Like I have all of these, what people would consider credentials to prove my credibility. Yet every client relationship I go into, my imposter syndrome is sitting right next to me. And so I continue to fight it. But between year one and year two of my business, I doubled my revenue and my profit purely by changing my pricing strategy and working less. All right. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. And, so, and I, 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 that's going to be reassuring as well, Nick, you know, for people listening in, because as you say, that, that's always going to be next to you. Yeah. But I think as the years goes on, as the experience kicks in and as you experience pitfalls, downfalls, you go through them, yep. you know, the ebbs and flows, all those years just help, just help the confidence, I guess. Yes. Um, it's and interesting. Say, can I add one other point? Sure. I think two, well, actually two points. One, I believe imposter syndrome is also rooted in fear of success and that people whose businesses start to sort of do okay, they, they keep raising the bar. They set new goals and they're, and they're afraid that they're not going to be able to achieve that. And therefore the fear of success, which comes obviously with, from the fear of failure, 
um, is a big problem. And so another thing for, for any of your listeners who are looking to, to go out, try their own business, do something on the side, is think about their fear of failure and fear of success. And again, it's not to get rid of those fears, but what you're going to, to do with it and acknowledging that failing is part of learning and it's okay and success is okay also. It's a really interesting point. Think, think about this one. You've started business, it's succeeded. It succeeded quick, it started to make a profit quickly. What about, is there a point where you think, when is this gonna fail? Oh yeah, I have clients right now that started their business in April and they're doing very, very well and they think it's just luck. <laughs> and I'm like, this isn't luck. Like you guys are credible professionals, you have your strategy, you're doing these things uh, and all of that. And they're like, when our luck runs out, we're in big trouble. And business success is never luck or coincidence. It's hard, hard work. Um, but because of whether it's imposter syndrome or fear of success, they do not believe that what they have done has contributed to that success. Now, if their business was failing, and I ask my clients this, is that attributed to bad luck or bad planning? And they're like, well, bad planning. I didn't really do things right. Yeah. So when you're yeah. doing well, it's luck. And when you fail, it's your fault. That doesn't make sense, right? But that's, a, that's, that's unfortunately our human brain and many people tends to do that. And we're our own worst enemy when it comes to that. We definitely are. We definitely are. If I'm going to take you back, you mentioned that when you were planning, you had a good network. And I think networks are really, obviously, very important. Mm -hmm. Let's step into relationships because, you know, we've all heard that people buy from people, that kind of thing. Yes. Um, you know, we've, we've spoke about imposter syndrome there. We've spoke about getting the price right. What about relationships? Do you know, do you have to be that people person? Do, is it all about relationships? It's, you do not need to be a people person, but it is all about relationships. Um, I, I am an introvert. I am a, a classic introvert who is able to function in an outgoing way with people, um, but it's not my comfort zone. And so I don't go to networking events. People invite me to these large you know, networking events in downtown Toronto, and I'm happy to go be a speaker. I can speak in front of a group of a thousand people I was, no just about, I was just about to say you're speaking to thousands of people now and you're an introvert. <laughs> yeah, and I love, speak, I love speaking. I never turn down a speaking engagement and I love getting up in front and holding the microphone and speaking. You want, if you want me to walk the room and network, I am not good at that. I, that I am not in my comfort zone in the individual um, networking environment. That said, your relationships with people are, are very important, and, but there's different ways to develop those relationships. And part of it is knowing, again, where your comfort zone is. And if it is the one-on-one -on -one face to face coffee, great, you go and do that. If it is via Skype and you're not comfortable being on video, then do it via Skype with just voice. Do whatever works for you to build the relationships, which are based on that commonly used phrase, the know, like, and trust factor, because people will only buy from those people that they know, like, and trust, or the brand that they know, like, and trust. But you, you have to get out there, in, but in whatever way is your comfort zone. I know there are a lot of people who say to succeed, you have to get out of your comfort zone. You know, you're only living life once you're, you know, outside of your comfort zone. I'm not a huge um, supporter of that thought. I think you can be successful in your comfort zone by knowing yourself and really pushing yourself to excel within that, that zone. But it's all about, yeah, it's all about relationships. Because you, it's not only relationships with your prospective customers, it's with your existing clients, it's with your vendors, it's with, um, you know, the people that are sort of on the, the periphery, in a sense, of, of what you do. It's with your competitors. Um, it may be with ex what I call extended customers. I have some clients that they're, they're, their target customer is children. Well, the, the parents of those children and the families of those children are their extended customer. So they have to really start to know and build relationships amongst all of that because it really comes down to, again, knowing the pain points and problems. And if you don't know your, your, have your relationships, you wouldn't know those problems. Um, and then in turn, they begin to know, like, and trust. 
and it takes time, especially in the online space. It is much slower than I would have ever anticipated. Just thinking about that online space, and and, and you know, you, you mentioned about hard work, and you know, the the culture now is to hustle, and and, and I've been speaking a lot, and I've mentioned this a few times about burnout. Yes. And I'm I'm concerned about that. Um, people, you know, feeling that the need to work, you know, extensive hours. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's become a, a societal. Um, reward, I guess, or status with being very, mm. very busy. Like you speak to someone, how are you? Oh, I'm so busy. Oh, and that me- me equals success. Busyness yeah. is not synonymous with success. Um, and people have to find and identify, and this comes from self-awareness, what's important to them and making sure they have time in their life to balance and not when I, when I say balance, I don't mean 50-50, but yeah. keeping all of those things that are important to them and different things have different priorities in different times, but to keep those all in check. And that can really, I think, help avoid burnout. And I have a lot of people who say, well, Nikki, you seem to, to work so much because I also own a sep- another unrelated business to all of this. So I have two businesses of which I, which I sort of an 80-20 split of my, my time and energy. And a lot of people say, you, you know, you work a lot. You're so, you're so busy. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not at all in the sense, like I have time every day to go to the gym. Um, I have the luxury that if I want to stay up late, I can, and be able to sleep in in the morning. If I so desire, I could take a nap at two o'clock in the afternoon, pretty much on any given day. Um, <laughs> if I, if I want to, this is sounding great. And, but it's, but it's something that I had to consciously i mean i'm comfortable with it now yeah. um but we have this sense that you need to work from 8 a.m till 8 p.m to be successful and i think one of the biggest lessons i'd learned is when because people were saying you know when you work for yourself you're not going to have time for a vacation you're just going to always be on even if you go on vacation you're always going to have to be you know ready to go and you're going to potential for have potential for burnout When I was working in the corporate sector, one of the things I found stressful was that I had a certain number of vacation days that I could take per year. And if I wanted to take a vacation in September, I had to start thinking about that in April because I had to ask, put in my request to my boss. And then I would have to wait to see if that was approved. And although it was always approved, I had this sense of that someone else was in control of whether or not I was going to be able to take downtime when I wanted and I couldn't pay for my vacation until I had the approval. Yeah. So the, that for me in terms of risk of burnout was much higher because I was not in control. And one of the things I really looked forward to when I launched my business is that I could have this elusive laptop lifestyle. I could be sitting anywhere. I think it's, I think it's worse in the corporate world. I totally agree. I mean, with- yeah. I remember facing burnout like big style when I was really going at it. And you know yourself, you can't get away. The emails and everything is yeah. coming. And I remember going to see the doctor and I said, you know, I'm really stressed out here. And he's, he kind of, I kind of explained my lifestyle to him. And he said, yeah. look, you really need to kick back a little bit. You need a vacation. Right. Um, and I just laughed. I said, I can't take a vacation. I've got I've got deals dropping. I've got, you know, a pipeline that's, that's going to drop. I, I can't take a vacation. He said, look, you're going to have to. Or yeah. you've got, you know, are, are things gonna, the choice is going to be made for you. Right. So uh, he said, just leave your phone at home and, you know, don't, what? Leave your yeah. phone at home. Don't answer emails for two weeks. Are you kidding me? And your anxiety climbs just by hearing that. Of course. So I mean, one of the worst parts in the corporate world of going on vacation is when you come back, how yeah, many yeah, yeah. emails and voicemails and meetings have you missed and you're far behind because the project launched when you weren't there um, was very, very difficult. And I know, look, you know, I'm thinking when I have my own business, like I'm going to be able to take vacation when I want. I can take my laptop if I want. I have friends down in, you know, Southern Florida. I can go sit on their beach. And interestingly, where I used to try to get two vacations a year to avoid burnout when I was in the corporate sector, I have only been away once in the three years that I, since I've had my own business because I no longer have the need for a vacation. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. My, I, can, I, can, I can wind down and decompress yeah. on any given day should I want to or need to. Yeah. There's going to be lots of people listening to this now, writing their um, letters to their managers now. Yeah. Calling it a day. 
<laughs> and if they need help starting their business, they can call. <laughs> well, there you go. There's, there's a nice segue. So we're getting towards the end of our discussion. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? I mean, could you help anybody who is listening? Oh, absolutely. If people... Um, You know, I I even offer what I call a business idea consultation or a business strategy consultation because a lot of people are like, you know, I have this idea I'd love to do, but I don't even, I'm not even sure if it's, it's, is that a business? Like, can I actually do that? So I offer a 30 minute business consultation, an idea consultation to people just to share their idea. I talk to them about their strengths, their competencies, the viability of it, and they leave with actual action steps as to what they need to do in order to make that a viable business should they decide to to go down that path. I work a lot with people in planning out how to fire themselves and what they need to do in a concrete way. So people share a lot of um, personal details with me related to their own financial situation, that type of thing. And as many people I advise, you know, you can't leave your job because you 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 have five children under the age of nine and you need an income. Um, and so I work with people in a lot of different ways, both one-on-one and in groups. I offer a, a group coaching uh, workshop, which is called Business Base Camp, and where we go through a four-week program of how to, to get your business set up and get started. And I do a lot of one-on-one coaching. Um, so I, I work with people in a lot of different ways. But in particular, if you have listeners that are really just questioning, you know, should I give this a try? Um, you know, happy to have the, the conversation. Everything is held confidential. Um, there's no sales pitch on it. I, I have a real desire to help as many aspiring entrepreneurs uh, as possible um, just figure out if this, is, if this lifestyle and this commitment to hard work is right for them. Excellent. That's why we're here, Nikki. Yes, absolutely. You're, I mean, you're, I mean the, I'm sure your audience and the guests that you, um, you, you speak with bring so much value to um to what your audience needs that yeah thanks for saying that and, and i'm sure they do I, I get a lot of feedback and um i mean that's why i started this i've got a real passion for that as well and i've been in the same place as you where you know you've always had that dream to start something and and lots of listeners here now are, are in that place so these 30 40 minute podcasts are, 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 are great for helping them out like that excellent yeah very valuable so where can we find you, Nikki? Uh, I can be found in a few places. I have um, my website, which is nikkimorris.com. That's N-I-C-K-I-M-O-R-R-I-S.com. Uh, that is my, uh, my business coaching website, and that's where most people find me. I can also be found... Um, on Facebook under Nikki Morris or Ignite Your Passion. Ignite Your Passion is my online coaching brand. And I also have a private Facebook group for anyone who is in the health space, whether that's a health and wellness coach, uh, someone who is a health practitioner. Um, And that's a private Facebook group called All About Health Business. And even if someone is not in the health space, but they're thinking of a business in the area of of wellness or weight loss or fitness or anything like that related to lifestyle, um, both men and women, um, they're more than welcome to join that group. I share tons of information uh, in that group, uh, and there's no there's no sales. There's no people don't have to feel that they're you know buying into anything. Uh, it's really about sharing knowledge and and learning about business. Great stuff. Well, what I'll do, Nikki, I'll put some links on the show notes to those. Oh, um, fantastic. Places, yeah. You just yep. send me those by email and we'll get those out to the listeners. I can do that. I can also send you a promo code for any of the listeners who would like 50% off the business idea consultation. Um, and if they go onto my website and enter that promo code, they can take advantage of that. Well, Nikki, thanks for your time. It's been great speaking to you. Thank and you. Uh, ho- 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 I hope we don't get snowed in too much this year. <laughs> no, fingers crossed. <laughs> thanks to Nikki Morris there. Just listening back to that, there was some great content in there. I hope you got some good takeaways or just a warm, fuzzy feeling about making that leap. It's good to hear the planning phase as well. That was really interesting for me. You know, when you're going to leap and you're trying to get everything aligned, ready for the switchover when you fire yourself. If you've done that, let me know. It'd be great to hear from you. If you're in the middle of that phase, again, I'd love to hear um, your feedback because you can help shape the show going forward. Is there anything that you'd like clarification on? Is there anything you'd like help on? We can get some guests to cover that off. 
Remember to share this podcast via all the usual social media channels and we can help as many people as we can to follow their dreams. So until next time, I'm Ian Farrer. This is the Industry Angel. Thanks for listening.